What inspires an author who is a world famous would be pickler? Let's find out. But before we do, if for the latest author interviews and behind the book stories, please subscribe to my channel. Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher and welcome to this week's episode of All About Books. I am so excited to have author Carrie Claire with me today. Carrie is a blogger, an editor, a writer, and she likes books even more than she likes tea. We'll be discussing her second novel, Waiting for a Star to Fall, which was published by Doubleday Canada. It, it follows the story of Brooke, who is a young woman caught up in the orbit of a much older rising political star, superstar named Derek. They fall in love, it's complicated. But when Derek is accused of sexual misconduct and is, Brooke is forced to re-examine their relationship and try to make sense of the man she loves. Welcome, Carrie. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. Now I am dying to know, would be pickler. Yes, so a big part of being a writer is, is failing, right? Being open to um, messing up and having to start over again. And so a long time ago, I lived in Japan and living in Japan can sometimes do funny things to a person, I think. And I got, um, yeah, they're really into hobbies there. What is your, I taught conversational English. And so what is your hobby was always something that we talked about from the very beginning. And so I got really into hobbying, took up pickling. I was terrible at it because um, I was also illiterate in Japan. So I couldn't read any of the labels in the grocery store. So I just winged it and it didn't work. Um, so my pickling career was very short, uh, but I was better at blogging. And so Pickle Me This became the name of my blog. <laughs> okay, and Carrie, what does inspire you? Books, reading, right? I think there's a quote by Elizabeth Hay that I love about how um, when she writes, she's riding on the coattails of the people who've written the books that are, that are all over her house. And she describes herself as doing that when she writes. And I really identify with that. Um, I love literature too, because I don't think you have to be a writer to be part of the culture. Readers are super important. And so reading is what inspires me. And I guess also being confused about things inspires me, having questions and wanting to explore and figure out what the answers are. Fabulous. Now, you've written a fantastic Me Too novel. Thank you. You're welcome. And Carrie, so what came first? Was it Brooke or Derek or the storyline? Well, this novel was born from a very specific thing. I was reading the newspaper one day three years ago, I think, mm -hmm. and I saw a photo of a disgraced politician. He's not disgraced anymore. Guess what? He was fine. Yes. He's still a yes. politician. But at the time he was disgraced and mm -hmm. he'd been rumored to have had all these inappropriate relationships with much younger women mm -hmm. who worked for him. And he'd had other allegations of sexual misconduct as well. But it was all this atmosphere of kind of untoward behavior um, displaying poor character. He was defending himself furiously. He, yes. you know, he, he has sisters and he has, he has a mom. So like, how could he do anything wrong? Right. right. Um, and then a photo was in my morning newspaper of him with his on again, off again, girlfriend, they called her, who was, he was about um, 38. I think she was 22. She worked for him. Like it was just everything that he'd been being accused of. And I know he'd been accused of criminal acts and you know, that, that was not um, what he was, he, I don't think anything came of those allegations, but of just him being kind of a scumbag. That was, yeah. <laughs> and there was the photographic evidence. And I saw that picture and I saw the woman and um, they were at a rib fest. It was not a glamorous occasion. And I saw her and I thought, wow, like she looks like a really ordinary person. Yeah. And I mean that in the best way possible. Like she looks like she could be anybody. And there she is sort of caught in this relationship. Um, this, her whole life is being dragged into the public spotlight. She probably loves him because sometimes when you're 22, 23, you 
don't make the best choices. And yeah. she just captivated me. And I thought, I want to understand this person. And uh, the book was born out of that. Fantastic. Um, and I also love that you dedicate your book to women who are 23 years old. <laughs> I thought that was great. And by, you know, certainly Brooke is 23 by the end of the book. Can you tell me more about specifically your character, Brooke? What you know, it took me a long time to get to know her. When <laughs> I, I think maybe, you know, I, this is not um, an untypical situation. I was thinking so much about Derek, the, the male character. Yeah. Uh, he was the center of the book. And as you said at the beginning, she's in his orbit. And so he mm. was the... Uh, what the book revolved around in my mind and you know when I pitched mm -hmm. the book and when I wrote um, what I thought would be the copy of the, the book it was about him and it was about her mm -hmm. sort of making sense of, of him and their relationship but I thought far more about him than I did about her and um, I had a wonderful editor her name is Bhavna Chohan at Doubleday Canada and I just loved working with her and you know, about a year before the book came out, um, a draft came back and she said, I don't know enough about what Brooke is feeling. And she'd mm -hmm. gone through my manuscript and had at every point said, what is she feeling? What is she feeling at, at pivotal moments? Because Brooke is someone who keeps her cards close to her chest, yes. right? She, um, and, and I realized that I didn't know how she was feeling and that was a real revelation it opened up a whole layer of the book to me and i realized yeah i didn't know her as well as i i should and so in the next draft i really did explore her emotions and it's tricky because she's not an emotional character she's not throwing herself on the floor and crying and she's she's very much trying to be composed because she's young but has found herself in an adult milieu, right? She's working with grown-ups and sort of trying to show that she belongs there. And so being composed and not reacting too hard to things is, is what kind of her, um, her mode of operation is. And so I had to explore to find out what was going on beneath that surface. And I think she's just someone who is, is figuring things out. 23, I, I think other people, you know it, it's a symbolic age there are lots of 23s it could happen at many times in life but um for brooke i think i she thought that this point in her life was one where the stakes were so high and you know she was in her career she was in this relationship and she had to get it right because what you don't know yet when you're 23 or around that age is that you get other chances to do things and you get to reinvent yourself and you even often get to make mistakes and get second, you know, get another chance to, to get it right. But she doesn't know that. And so when it all falls apart for her in her career and her relationship, she thinks she's done and that is devastating. And so it's sort of a, an interesting coming of age, I think, is, is when you realize how long life is and that you don't have to know it all from the, from the very start. Now, you'd mentioned, Carrie, that you spent a lot of time with Derek. And, you know, as writers, we do, you know, we know our characters very well. Um, and did you find, because you knew him so well, were you sympathetic towards him at all? I think I have a crush on him. <laughs> yes. And you know what? I dreamt about him. I mean, everyone's having weird dreams right now, right? This is like in these COVID days who we're all dreaming about crazy things, but I've never dreamt about a fictional character before. Um, <laughs> so yeah, he, I think he's got a place in my mind. I'm, he's one of those, there's a lot of women and I think I, I would have been one of them who sees someone who is messed up and a bit broken. They think what you need is me. I'm <laughs> going to be the solution to your problems. Um, and I think like, I understand his charm and I purposefully wrote him that way because if I'd made him gross and awful, yeah, the fact of Brooke falling in love with him would have made no sense. So mm -hmm. I had to give him, um, yeah, that there had to be sympathy for him and just for him to be a human. Most people are human beings. And uh, so, yeah, it was very interesting for me to write 
him. And I do think he's loathsome. And I think he, I, I have a lot of newspaper clipping-ish parts in the novel where I write about how he is portrayed. Yeah. And I'm fascinated by how men in leadership positions or any positions are portrayed in our media. I mean, we talk a lot about women, women's bodies always get referred to and, and yeah. things like, like if reporters at our house, like talking about how it's clean, like all of those things, but, but how we talk about men is just mm -hmm. bizarre. Um, and the way they get mythologized. Um, and so I really wanted to capture that. And that goes to a person's head. I think a person, if, if everyone's telling you that you're, you're a hero and, and that you're a leader and the kind of second coming and all of these things, yeah. I think, I don't think that's really good for anybody. Um, so yeah, I was, I was playing with, um with with that kind of depiction in the media um and and yeah the way that women want to reach out and, and be the one for some of these men yeah we want to save them all <laughs> yeah who cares what they can bring us that doesn't seem to be part of the i'm 23 i'm older than 23 now so i understand that there's more to a relationship than just you know being somebody's band-aid so that's good <laughs> Oh, what else do I have here for you? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, here we go. So um, your novel questions, just how much are you willing to forgive in the name of love? So as a writer, you know, was it hard for you to carry Brooke through this journey with the knowledge of a woman who has has lived life already? Um. I think where I tapped into my own biography, like this is the least biographical thing I've ever written, which is fabulous. But um, I really, I remember the longing and like mm -hmm. unrequited love, you know, wanting someone who didn't feel the same. And I tapped into those emotions, which I seem to still remember really viscerally. Yeah. And, um, and I think that that, that that carried me through it. I I they I don't know. It, it they weren't far away. It was a long time ago. Now I um, have not had unrequited love for some time. But yeah, it it wasn't far from the surface. And um, yeah, that feeling of longing and not getting anything in return, and how sad and lonely that feels. Yeah. Um, and you know, I wanted her to come to a revelation about him. I I know some readers maybe I kept saying, I wanted to shake her. <laughs> people, yeah. Yeah. people understand her, but also mm -hmm. like, once you know better, you're like, stop it, Brooke, right? Turn around, go do something else. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry that she couldn't come to that revelation sooner, but I think that we all have to sometimes learn, learn these mm -hmm. things the hard way. <laughs> Yeah, I know when I was reading Carrie, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this, this could have been me. So I'm sure so many women can relate to well, like waiting for the phone to ring, you know, oh. um, and, and it's such, she's so passive. She in, in every aspect of her life, but that in particular, you know, like it's waiting for him to come to her rather than taking some agency in her own life. And oh. Yeah. And the, the excuses too that she would make for him, like I was just, that's another thing that was just so real in reading your book. I think, especially as women, we do excuse a lot of behavior. And she has to, because if yeah. she really sees him for who he is, she's implicated. And it means that these choices that she's made that, as mm -hmm. I said, she feels so much is riding on because she's young and she doesn't know how much more life she still has before her. Um, she doesn't understand so she has to make everything she's done okay she wants if she sees him for who he is it makes all her choices and her feelings um it just makes her feel stupid and she doesn't want to do that she takes herself really seriously yeah now i won't spoil the ending because i i love the ending but oh, i'm so glad yes um when you did was that the ending that you'd envisioned right from the get-go or did it change as you got deeper into writing your book? I don't usually know where my books mm -hmm. are going to go. I write my first draft to find out, I guess, what the dest I'll know the destination when I get there. So yeah, I wasn't planning on that, but I also, mm -hmm. um, I, it couldn't have been different, right? I, 
No, yeah. Yeah, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Carrie, what are you currently working on? Um, I wrote a novel in between my two published books. Mm -hmm. And so that book I have been working on for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope it doesn't show in a bad way. <laughs> and so that book is currently out for submission. So at the moment, I'm not writing a novel for the first time since 2014. So I'm hoping to start something new soon. But I also teach blogging courses. And I have a course yeah. coming up starting next week. So that oh, is nice. what I'm doing right now. And yeah, I hope to start a new book this summer. Oh, my do you have any any ideas percolating for the new book or no, like I have I have a few I'm making a list, I really want to find out how to be more active and harnessing my ideas, my ideas seem to mm -hmm. sort of arrive like a gift, like I open the newspaper and there's that photo and oh, I love so that. maybe I just have to wait, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> It'll come. It'll I hope come. so. <laughs> so, Carrie, um, before I get you to read, I was wondering if you could share um, with any aspiring writer out there, what, what piece of advice could, could you give them? Don't peak too soon. Mm -hmm. So I always wanted to be a writer, like since I was a school child and I wrote in school. There's so many opportunities as students, um, you know, in high school school and college university to write. Um, and so I, I took all those opportunities. And then I got out into the real world and found that it was a little bit harder. <laughs> and um, I took a master's program at U of T when I was 25. And it was a master's of creative writing. And it was a it was a good experience. Um, but the thesis I wrote was a novel. And it was not good. And <laughs> Yeah, it was not good at all. And it took me 10 more years to publish a book. And I would have been really devastated to think that, you know, that this, this master's thesis is a failure. It'll take me another decade to publish my first novel. Um, but I'm so glad I really love my first novel. My master's thesis was not good. If I had, you know, everyone kept saying, don't give up. But I think I knew. Um, and if I hadn't given up, I would, I would, if I'd succeeded in publishing it, I, I'm, I would have had a book I was a bit regretful about. So um, I'm not sorry that I had to wait 10 more years and publish my first novel when I was 37. Um, I'm, I'm glad now it all worked out the way it was supposed to. Ah, that's great advice. Thank you for that. You're welcome. And um, so everyone sit back and get comfortable again. Carrie's going to read an excerpt um, from, I'll just hold it up again, waiting for start of fall which by the way Carrie I have been singing that song in my head now like for weeks so so thank you very much I've got a little boy meets girl going on it's such a good song do you know they also wrote um how will I know by Whitney Houston and I want to dance with somebody I didn't know that they're like a pop hit machine. So yeah, I absolutely love their book and th or their song and thank them in the comments because it's such yes. a good title. And yeah, it's a bit catchy too. And it's it's perfect for the, for the, yeah. the book as well. So um, if you could just share with us why you've chosen to re read this particular pa passage, that would be great. So I'm going to read the opening of the novel because I feel like uh, another bit of advice for writers is, is plot. I discovered plot and everything came alive for me. I hadn't known about it before. What a trick. Um, and so this book, I think, is a little bit propulsive. And if I jumped in the middle, it might be harder to figure out where we're at. So I want to start at the very beginning as the wheels begin turning. Okay. And I also love the first line. <laughs> she hadn't been drinking. This was the thing. Yet that morning, Brooke woke up with a hangover, and it took about five seconds to put the night back together again. She had a different taste in her mouth, but the weight on her head was just the same. So what had happened? What had led to the restless, uneasy sleep that she was now shaking off like a blanket, eyes struggling to come to terms with the daylight? And then there it was, reality settling over her like dread. 
and it was all coming back the press conference, watching the live stream as her phone buzzed, a bombshell that ricocheted and the whole thing unfolding with no warning of what might happen next, except Brooke had some guesses. A level of insight into the general narrative that didn't serve to make her feel better or wiser. It made her feel worse and she'd broken out in a sweat even though her extremities were freezing and her legs were shaking the way they'd been shaking the second time, which was really the first time that Derek Murdoch kissed her. It was uncharacteristic. That's what they all said. The pundits and the people online who were paid to talk even when they didn't know what they were talking about. They explained how Derek wasn't a person who ran away from challenges, no matter how difficult. Principal. That's what they kept calling him. The key to his character, they supposed. They'd never seen him like this. So rattled and Brooke would admit, as she'd watched him falling apart on the screen, that she hadn't recognized him either. Could the breakdown be part of a performance? Was this the strategy they had in mind? Maybe it was supposed to be humanizing because she couldn't think of any other reason for Derek to have fared so poorly, professionally at least. He'd never been unprepared for anything in his life. Thank you so much, Carrie. That was fantastic. So that is just a little taste of waiting for a star to fall. Thank you for being a guest on this week's episode of All About Books. I'm thrilled to have met you and to learn more about, about your book. Um, what I'll do for the viewers out there, I'll put links down below in the description box so you can find um, I'll, links to Carrie's website and also where you can purchase a copy of her book. Be sure to come next back next week. Hopefully I'll be able to talk then. <laughs> And uh, I'll have another author and another behind the book story. Thank you for watching.